Hello, hello, and welcome back to my channel. This is Reality with DVD. How you doing? In honor of Mother Wendy. And I just wanted to do a movie review slash documentary review or whatever you want to call it of um, Quiet on the Set. I, I, I didn't really know the name of it, Quiet on the Set or The Orange Years. Because those documentaries kind of intermingle. Mark Summers speaks on all of them. And um, I'm going to get right on into it. It's a four-episode, four-part episode documentary. Like I said, I'm not sure if they consider it a documentary movie or TV show. I know it's a documentary, but I mean mixed in TV show. Sometimes documentaries are movies. Sometimes they're TV shows. So I'm just not sure. But it is airing on HBO Max streaming. And I'm not sure where else it's streaming because I checked Paramount Plus. I do have Paramount Plus. Uh, so I was checking on there and I was like, no, no, no. They're not going to expose themselves like that because Paramount Plus is sisters to Nickelodeon. But anyway, um, they always have to delve into the business. So the first episode really discusses all that. Now, all that I did watch, which is one of my favorite shows. I'm going to go back over history because I was there from the beginning. Shout out to Gen X. We were there from the beginning when Nickelodeon and MTV and all of that was first integrated into cable. When we first got cable, those were di the different packages. If you had basic regular cable back in the day, MTV, HBO, all that was sort of premium. Nickelodeon. You sort of kind of had to add them. So basically, back in the day, the the big three you could get on antenna just like you can now, which is what I do now. But however, but and however, um, you could get those channels clear, right? You have to worry about. You know, static interference, like, I, I, it's digital scrambling now with my antenna. But you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about the weather because, you know, it wasn't the same as, um, you know, antenna scrambling without cable. Pitch is always clear on the big three. Well, TBS was also a channel that came with the basic package. I believe it was just like... Um, TBS, NBC, CBS, like I said, make them clear. And then you had your premium package, which was the paid shows networks, which were, you know, the movie channel and HBO. My mother preferred the movie channel. But, you know, nowadays people prefer HBO. Back then it wasn't quite Cinemax had been inter integrated yet. And then you could add Nickelodeon MTV, which my mother did do. So we had basically had all of, Basic cable, and then the add-on channels. We had, um, we had MTV, um, Nickelodeon, and uh, uh, whatever the other one was. I named TBS. TBS. So, um, and then we were from the South. So you know, at that time, Ted Turner owned the South when he incorporated TBS onto his network and they had good programming on TBS. So okay, so for the kids, we had Nickelodeon, right? So back then it wasn't all of that actual in the innuendo with the slime. Because that's important to know what had started happening with the slime. Back in the day it was this show called You Can't Do That on Television. That was probably one of the first kid skit comedy shows that was on. Now I don't know exactly if it was some, um, because they didn't really go into uh You Can't Do That on Television. I don't remember that it was, okay? So the slime would come from the ceiling. Pour it from the bucket onto mostly this lady's name Moose's head, right? Because she was, the, I think she's probably about 15, 16 at the time. And she was the force multiplier of the show. The main character, she did all the introductions. So that began their sketch comedy. 
in my opinion. The show called You Can't Do That on Television. Now, in that show, it was a resistance to adults because with the history of um, Nickelodeon, it's supposed to be a resistance to adults. Then as time went on, we will find out that a lot of these cartoons did not have parental figures in the cartoons. Charlie Brown don't have parental figures in the cartoons either, but it still seems quite innocent, okay? So it didn't have all these parental figures in the videos. If you look back, you can't do that on television. It was a, an adult on there. He did all the skits, like, you know, he, he would be the teacher. He would be the uh, principal. He would be, you know, a cook in the cafeteria or whatever, okay? So... Then we had those little sketch comedy shows like this show called Hasi Sabupia. Hasi Sabupia. So it was like a, that show right there was sort of like a Sesame Street, okay? So I don't recall in my time all of this extra, we'll put an S in front of in your window, okay? Um, I don't think it was Usher in Dan. Schneider. Who, baby? When I saw Dan Schneider's big ass, I immediately knew who he was because in most, even though this was a top show, it did not play like that out, play out like that in a black household. It was two black people on there, uh, Robin Gibbons characters on there, and I think her name was Sarah, but I can't think of her last name. And then you have Dan Schneider's ass. They were on this show called Head of the Class. Did I know that Dan Schneider was a actual deviant? Absolutely not. But we're about to find out, aren't we? Moving forward on into this commentary. Now, let me just give a little history on Dan. The word on the street is, and we don't know if this is true, so everything in this video is alleged, and in my opinion, and information that we had gotten from the documentary, okay? So, Dan was the type of guy that was always picked last. It seems like that, in my opinion. And it seems like, you know, sometimes how like when people make it, they have to show you that they made it. And he has some kind of even though he worked with children, to me, it was always a power dynamic. It almost, to me, okay, here go my psychology coming into play. It was a power dynamic there that he wanted to show people that he had made it, yes. Also, he reverted back into childhood where he had these kids who were the popular kid and the nerd and all that type of stuff. And he reverted back to that, and he, you know, had to kind of humiliate the popular kid, in my opinion, from what I'm seeing and pulling out the innuendo. So when Dad came along, I was growing up and moving kind of away from Nickelodeon. So we have, you know, him coming in in the late 90s. So, like, in the early 90s, it was this show called 15. It was kind of mature. I don't think he had anything to do with 15. But 15 was the Nickelodeon version of a kid's soap opera. Again, no parental figures. No matter how old these kids got, they always said they were 15. That was the weird part about it. But anyway, I guess that's why they had to cancel it. Now, you know who started on that show? Just a little bit of history. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds was a star on this show called 15. He played the drums on there, as a matter of fact. But anyway, neither here nor there. Oh, yeah, back in the day, also, it was this network on there, uh, um, basic cake, well, came with the package. Um, it was like a religious channel. I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, it's, uh, the channel now still has, back then, still, that Robert's man. <laughs> Uh, well, Patrick, Patrick, what's his name? Patrick Roberts or something like that. Yeah. I mean, he's still on there, you know, one foot in the grave, I guess, but hey, I think his name was Pat Robert. Yeah. His channel was on there too. And Kids Incorporated came on that channel, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. 
in the cartoon that we watched that I find questionable and I found questionable then, which I stopped watching very early on, was like Rain and Stampy, Rocco's Modern Life, uh, Cat Dog, those right there, gross. And I thought just gross. Same thing with the slime. I thought just gross, not, you know, actual in the innuendo, but as I was saying, a little bit of history on Dan, uh, Dan Schneider, and he really was like, I'm going to show you, right? And so he uh, came up with this concept to do all that, which was brilliant, okay? Let's not take that away from him because that was the antithesis. Antis- antis- <laughs> Okay, you know what I'm saying, to like a Saturday Night Live, like, you know, even though this is about kids, so I'm going to show you kids and power, right? And, you know, like I said, it was, Nickelodeon was the type of network that just like was showing you no parental finger, like with my, even in my time with Rocco's Martin Life, he didn't have parents, but he lived on his own. And so did Rand the Snippet. You come to find out that these characters were actually teenagers. They weren't adults. At first, I thought Rocco was an adult. Then I found out later on that he was just like an intern going into adulthood, but he wasn't an adult. And then you have Rand the Snippet who were roommates and all the extra one in the window that, that in your window that you found out was going on in there. Okay? But that's neither here nor there. Back to Dan. And so when Dan came up with all that, here comes the actual in the window, in your face. But I wasn't watching all that like that, like that then, because by the time all that came into existence, and uh, like I said, I didn't know Dan Ryan was behind the scenes. I was uh, graduating from high school. So, and then when I got to college, I worked, so I didn't really get to watch TV like that, like that. You know, back then, but um, I was so excited because of the reboot, so I started back watching it. You know, once I had graduated from college, and you know, yeah, I'm a big kid at heart, okay, I still watch cartoons, and so I started watching all that, but I still didn't know, I didn't watch it like that, like that. And then when Victorious and all that, and Sam and Cat came into effect under Dan. That, that was more so late 90s, early 2000s with my nephews, okay? So I wasn't really watching it like that, like that then. But I do remember that episode with the actual innuendo that showed the little sneeze boy, the boy that was made out of noses. And then I'm looking at that like, oh, wow. Okay, he was made out of noses, and these noses were so big and the nose part with the nostrils on it was so big, it all, and it was long, elongated, it was like penis or testicles, okay? And then his superpower was, was sneezing out snot. And so in your mind, you're thinking that's just snot, right? And then he was sneezing snot out in people's faces, okay? And you see it, right? Then it comes to you. And then it comes to you with the realization that, yeah. And then if you think about it, when Dan came in, the slime no longer came from the ceiling. It shot out from different apparatus. Like like the slime machines. If you think back to it, it would shoot out of pipes and all these types of things. And it was more like ejaculation, in other words, versus back in the day just on you can't do that on television just falling from the south from the ceiling but man he hid his bullshit in plain sight disgusting so disgusting and amanda Bynes, she was dan's muse right you know you had the younger version of her, um, 
you know, like I said, I don't remember all the names of the characters because they were like in an ensemble cast. But I do remember the little curly hair, hair girl. She was quite funny. That started out with all that. And cute as she could be. Still cute. And according to her, she was the one who introduced Amanda Bynes. And Amanda Bynes, you know, she did three shows, right? She had, um, she had all that. She had her own show, uh, the Amanda Bynes show. And then she had uh, What I Like About You. And uh, Dan was a shadow over all these shows. So exerting power, exerting control, but then I'll, um, What I Like About You canned his ass, right? And they did exactly what they should have done. Amanda Bynes did that show where she had her own show, the Amanda Bynes show, and was, uh, I wish that her soul wasn't so disturbed because the type of impact that that young lady had on that type of company like, she was like a little miniature Carol Burnett. It's sad that, you know, all these things happened to her because Dan had so much control and she, her parents, you know, pretty much relented because of them wanting her to be a star. Him being in the hot tubs with her. Oh, my goodness. Sick. Makes me nauseous to think about it. Wow. Okay. And again, I cannot believe this man is not under jail somewhere. Couldn't be my kid. No, ma'am. Do you see? <clears throat> do you see the? Excuse me. The impact that this life had on Amanda when Amanda was going through these things, and we saw her in the press, and she was lighting people's stuff on fire, and she was doing all these things. I had no idea of what she had gone through behind the scenes. Keeping him happy, working on all these shows because at some point she did all that and Amanda Barron show at the same time. It's just that you know she was kind of wavering towards over towards getting her own show about the end of her time on um, all that. So. She was working a lot. And all she wanted to do was be a committed talent. And she was almost a high paid Ave. Put an LCL in front of it. She was that to Dan. And then, you know, once he was kind of ushered out of her life and she started to age out of the teen star thing, he started doing it to Amanda Cosgrove and Victoria Justice and Ariana Grande. But <laughs> this is, like I said, it's probably the most impactful documentary I have seen ever. And like I said, that includes Surviving R. Kelly. I would say that I am shocked and appalled about what was going on on the set of these shows. But I'm not so much shocked. But I remember... We're going to get into some of the episodes. 
And I do remember that episode of, um, I want to say maybe Victoria's. And I saw that episode with her with the shake weight, you know. And I was like, well, maybe that's just because that's the way the thing goes. But, you know, now that I'm in the psyche of Dan Schneider, mm, yeah, it was actual innuendo. And it was pretty much embedded in every one of the episodes of his little teen comedy dramas. (laughs) Wow. Wow sick then you have these three convicted westers on there you know brian peck jason tanby you know men luring you know these children into trust and wow it did not say that Dan Schneider had been convicted of anything, which is astounding. It seems to me that Drake Bell was the biggest victim. Jeanette McCurdy, I remember Jeanette. I mean, it was always an innocence loss looking at Jeanette. You know, I think she was on iCarly. You know, I didn't. I thought iCarly Carly was real stupid. But, you know, like I said, this this is around the time when my nephew was growing up. So it wasn't like some, I'm just sitting there watching it for entertainment. I'm sitting there watching like I do with, you know, a lot of shows that my kids watching because it's on and, you know, they're watching it. So, but I distinctly remember that episode with the shake weight on Victoria's. <laughs> I remember that like it was yesterday when I saw it. And then I saw the, the still shot of it. And then, you know, them doing the reels. I was like, yep. Yep. I questioned it then. I questioned it when I saw it. I was like, hmm. But like I said, I also questioned the cat dog. You know, they a cat and a dog connected from the butt, like, uh, you know, like how dogs and when they capitulate to produce other dogs, puppies, mm-hmm, how they get stuck from the butt. I always looked at cat dogs like that, even as a child. So I don't think everything started with Dan. I think it was enhanced. But, like, cat dog ran a stamp. yeah. I didn't do those, you know. I always thought it was underlying, you know, any window in those. And, you know, that's during my time. But, um, yeah, it's fascinating and sad in the fact that I'm sitting here trying to do these reviews on shows like this as a former social worker. It is very very hard to to watch and to even do the reviews on because it's so sad and so um and you know it tugs at you knowing that this happened to children and and the it was you know and then i call it was revamped i think and uh it plays on paramount plus i want to say you know, she's more of an adult now and, you know, no, no Jeanette McCurdy. And I guess they looking at Jeanette like, you got Dan in trouble. No, Dan got Dan in trouble. And the blaming of these children is, oh, wow. You know, you know, like I said, it seemed to me that Drake was the uh, biggest victim of, of his. I'm sure they were, there were many, many more. You know, like his bigger stars or what you would call like the bigger stars that still are on the scene. Did you notice how they didn't appear? Sad. Because I really think that they would have had a bigger impact. Like your Kells and your Kenans and your um, what, uh, Miranda Cosgrove herself, Ariana Grande. All of them did not appear. When Ariana was clearly... <laughs> A victim, in my opinion, all the toe sucking, thumb sucking, you know, um, the sucking of the udders, you know, the like, uh, you know, he had some of the guys sucking udders, you know, gloves filled with with liquid, 
the ejaculation shots where, you know, like um, the actress that played on Zoe 101 was talking about how, you know, she had to squirt something from a, a tube and then it shot right in, in Jamie Lee and Spears' face. You know, she didn't speak. You know, that's probably a lot of, you know, her problem. She hypersexualized. Remember Jamie, Jamie Smith, Spears, you know, unlike most of the children in Hollywood, you have to give her credit. She, you know, did not hide being a teen mother. This may have contributed to all of that. All of this, uh, the the whole thing with Brian Pick and the pickles. I mean, obsessed with pickles. So am I. <laughs> So am I, but then you see him sticking as Pickle Man. You see him, Pickle Man, and then you see him sticking pickles through doorknob holes and all this old type of stuff. And then you're like, yeah, yeah. And then he was like a huge editor, put a P in front of it, and he he's the one who uh, really groomed Drake. And I was like, when I saw Drake. I remember, I said, Drake, now that I understand, he is one of those children that is a victim that turned editor in a way. I mean, you know, we've heard the stories, and he did cop to sending inappropriate texts, inappropriate pictures, and things like this to minors. That's how it started with him. Jason Tandy was a huge um, perpetrator um, doing the, you know, the child pee and the uh, the text messages showing his anus and, you know, wow. This, this documentary, I told my sister, I said, this documentary, I know that Survivor R. Kelly just like really, you know, did something to me, you know, I know that, that he was messing with minor girls and, you know, traveling in closets and, and, you know, his innuendo as well, you know, he was into all this bondage and, you know, placing women into vulnerable spots where they were felt locked away. But this Dan Schneider thing, wow, I mean, it's, it, it's different for me, I guess because R. Kelly was the, the adult, but to see a grown man who was allowed to interact with children in this way so publicly, and then, you know, giving this to, feeding this to our children while, as they watched is sick. And like I said, I haven't heard anything about him going to prison or anything like that. This man actually harassed women. You know, he had women. Oh, it was, he had a whole thing of where these women would have to give him massages up. Uh, massages on set and his foot fetish. And like I said, seeing Ariana Grande sucking her own toe, I mean, I'm pretty sure that just lit his world up, huh? And the whole episode of them talking about a taint, like not tainted, but the skin between the perineum and the penis or the vagina. Wow. Nobody. Nobody. And then you have the young man whose mom was always involved but too involved. They didn't like those types. Drake's dad was involved, too involved. Called him a homophobe because he didn't want his son alone with Brian. And then all of these huge stars, including Alan Thicke, Joanna Kearns from, you know, teen stars that are now adults, who I'm pretty sure he had some type of effect on if he didn't touch them in an inappropriate way I'm pretty sure he was grooming them towards that direction writing letters against Drake in the trial 
Vaccinate. Now, and I mean, now when I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, I got to do a video on this, you know, as a former mental health worker slash social worker. It just, it's different from, it's different from, for me seeing it, and it's different for me seeing the grooming process. Of course, I, I've been in the trenches, so I know firsthand what it's like seeing someone who's affected by, um, a West Station, and you know, in in my opinion, even DHS didn't do enough. We didn't do enough counseling, especially with young men who have been arrested, who offended because of their West Station, and then it turned into a vicious cycle. And the 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 ridiculous part about us in compassion and empathy. I had a child just like Drake, only he went, he was so severely abused, uh, actually, that we pretty much had to, and it would be times when I would be alone with him and I just wasn't feeling comfortable, but we just had to keep him away from children as much as we could because he was so overly hypersexualized. He could not be in the room alone with little girls or girls or around them in the facilities that he was in, because he was always a fan, and we would always have to move. He would always a fan, and we would always have to move. And I mean, his his chart was extensive. But, ah, oh shoot, I almost said his name. <laughs> you know I can't do that. But, because um, he's a minor. He was protected as a minor. He aged out of the system. And I have, don't have any idea where he is now. Of course, you know, I haven't worked at DHS in about 15 years, so I don't know. But I, I, I remember him vividly, and I remember me still having compassion for him because of what he had experienced, too. And that makes me sad because I know it's a vicious cycle involved. And um, the same same way with Drake. If he doesn't continue to offend or hasn't offended since this documentary was made, it would surprise me. It really would. And I hope that he he's registered as well. Now, he has to live his life because he was, I don't even want to use the word tainted anymore. Wow. Oh. Because of, his, because of his experience. So, so much that I can say about Nan Schneider. I, you know, wow. And, and what was so disturbing is I did not know what his role was so much behind the scenes. Like, he was that much involved in these shows. Because I didn't know he was the showrunner for most of the shows. I, when I saw him, in a, in a way, I was kind of excited to see that he had made it because I remember him from head of the class. And, like, you know, all of those kids were the underdogs on head of the class. So, you know, you always room for, for them, even off TV and behind the scenes. Not Robin Gillings and, and, and Sarah Evans or whatever the other black lady name was. But I'm talking about the more nerdy of the ones in the group. I'm talking about, like his character, Dan's character, and the guy that wore glasses, those, because, you know, even outside of that old, really, really intelligent group of people and the, uh, the quote-unquote nerds, the head of the class, you know, it was some cool kids in there, that one cool kid who wore the leather jacket. Of course, I don't remember none of their names. This is early 90s, okay? I'm 14, 15 years old, but I vividly remember the show. <laughs> Like yesterday, okay? 
And I immediately knew who he was. And I was like, yeah, 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 okay, okay. I had no idea that that was the Dan Schneider that these kids were talking about until I saw this documentary. Now, with that said, I'm not going to cover everything because I want you all to watch it. Um, This is a review of it. And I came to you as a former social worker, former mental health worker, being touched by this and so disturbed by it. And, you know, I'm probably not going to be able to sleep for a little while. I mean, it was just, <sighs> wow. Um, it just that disturbing to me. And like I said, so sad. Um, these children's lives have been touched forever. Never, They'll never be the same. And, uh, and you wonder as an adult because you know like I said you know the fact that all these stars came out in defense of Brian he was able to get other TV gigs after you know the sweet life of Zach and Cody and you look back at sweet life of Zach and Cody and how those kids were affected yeah um the only persons that I can say that you don't think that anything just like happened to in that way, it's just very few, isn't it? Very few, like your Tatiana Ali's and then your uh, Keisha Knight Pulliams and, you know, those kids in that group. But, you know, because they were more so coming on at a time when the parents were allowed to stay on set and how Sonya Norwood always came in to protect Brandy against Althea. <sighs> yeah, I heard Brandy's version and I heard after his version, and I know the truth lies somewhere in between there. And I've always kind of disliked. I had a very, very strong dislike for Sonya Norwood. But as I look back on it, for her being that tough, be on the set of these shows that her daughter was on, she probably needed it. <laughs> Now, I don't see Brandy as being hypersexualized like that, but it really didn't help Ray J, not did it? That's a different story. But I'm saying I see why she was the way she was. Probably she knew some things, had seen some things. And she probably pretty much saved Brandy's life because of it. These children um, need deep, intensive therapy. Probably, and the ones that are in therapy probably are going to definitely need it for the rest of their life. It was, like I said, even with me seeing Survivor R. Kelly, I think this was just on a different level of disturbing for me, seeing this. But, you know, like I said, it is definitely a must-see. Um, out of the five-star category, this is a five-star documentary. Very informative, very detailed. Um, they're just now, you know, when they came into the Me Too movie, getting rid of Dan, and he just spent years with these types of behaviors on the sets, and like I said, these children are going to be, uh, now adults, are uh, definitely going to be affected for the rest of their lives with this. Again, five stars. Highly recommend it. Um, all my viewers that see this, you definitely need to watch this and, you know, be hyper aware of what could possibly happen to your children if you get them into the entertainment business. And the sad part about the entertainment business is we have to be, if we're going to show family dramas and family comedies and, you know, kids shows, we actually have to be entertained by children. I mean, unless you do like, uh, unless all the kids look young, like, I can't remember her name. I think her name was Michelle or something like that. Or, you know, how uh, Leah Remini, Leah Remini was mostly on teen shows, she primarily an adult. Taraji P. Henson played 
a teen on sister sister she was an adult a lot of times if you got the black don't crack type teens they could play yeah but i'm talking about like the minors uh, apparently um tia and Tamara mother's mother was very intrusive a lot of um, producers and things like that hated her but now we know why because when Drake's dad was intrusive <laughs> and you know they got the mother involved when behind his bed got the mother involved and he was fired look at what ended up happen to, happening to Drake um, just very sad very disturbing and again, highly recommend. And with that, I'm going to close. And as I do when I close, I'm going to chunk them up. Juices. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Hit the notification bell button so you can be notified when I upload a video. And I'm out.